Singapore has a well-known zero-tolerance policy when it comes to drugs. And so for those who are caught taking drugs, their journey can lead here to a prison complex. Now, while that experience is difficult for all, we're here today at Singapore's only women's prison to find out how the experience differs for female drug users. Do they have different challenges and needs? And how best can we support them on their road to recovery? Inside the prison's drug rehabilitation centre, an art therapy workshop is ongoing. And it's where we meet Lina and Sarah, both 34 years old. I am a single mother. I got a kid's uh, daughter, five years old, and I work as a logistic. I'm a mother of six and also a caregiver to my paralysed father. And both incarcerated more than once for drug use. Less than 10% of Singapore's prison inmates are women, but they make up close to 16% of those at the Drug Rehabilitation Centre. And this number has been creeping up. Women as a proportion of drug abusers in Singapore is at a 15-year high, at over 17%, according to data from the Central Narcotics Bureau. For Lena, she ended up here because of a romantic relationship turned toxic. I'm not safe, like... He know whatever what I do. Because of him, I really angry and then I took the ice to make me calm down. And can I ask, if, is this boyfriend also the father of your child? Yes. Yeah. Does that make things more difficult? Yes. That is my me more mental torture. It's a common picture among women drug abusers. They are involved in relationships characterised by uh, abuse or victimisation. And this really affects the way they see themselves. Um, and because of that, they would turn to drugs to cope. For Sarah, it was caregiving that pushed her over the edge. I need to take care of my paralysed father, wash him every day. I need to carry him with a very big size. Then I need to do all the, the as a mother, responsible to my children. So I, I think like uh, there was no one there when I need help. It led her ultimately to relapse, in all entering the DRC three times. The effects of such persistent drug use can take a toll on women's bodies, such as their liver and kidneys. We have a higher body fat, fat ratio, but we have a lower volume water ratio. What happens is that we are more sensitive to the effects of substances. And if you compare a man and a woman who use the same substance over the same period of time, the woman unfortunately will also end up getting more health consequences faster than men. The physical changes that happen during recovery can also be more triggering for women. During early recovery, they will start to put on weight. And it might actually lead them to go back to thinking about taking back the drugs because they will always remember that during that time, I really was much slimmer. Women relapse and re-enter prison more often than men. Latest figures show that almost a third of female drug offenders re-offend within two years of release. One association that supports women in recovery says one reason is that they face harsher expectations when they're out. The family say it's payback time. You, you got to take care of the family, not just yourself. I worked in the Mere Harvey House before, and it was interesting uh, to me that for the men, if they decided to extend their program because they felt they're not ready to rejoin uh, society, the family members more often than not are quite supportive. But for the women, I don't hear family members uh, uh, for the idea. And these challenges that come after release are something one ex-offender knows all too well. My name is Sabrina Chong Abdullah. I'm a mother of six beautiful kids, uh, three girls, three boys. I'm presently in my 40s, but 41, I don't know. Lah. Then after that, um, I'm an ex-offender of drugs. She's been drug-free for nine years now, after three stints in prison. And it hasn't been an easy journey, especially immediately after release. There's no everyday routine. There's no purpose in life. There's no planning. Prison, you know, it's, it's a different ball game, right? It's a controlled environment. But the minute they come out, there's a lot of distractions. And yet, she's one of the lucky ones, with a supportive husband, a home to go back to, and a baking business she's since started up. Others, often facing abusive family environments, seek help here instead. When they are released from prison, they have nowhere to go. Some of my uh, ex-clients have ever stayed in the staircase. They stay in the staircase, some in the park. I have people who actually stay in the uh, fast food chain. Yeah, they make that their permanent home. Eye Care Hub started eight years ago with the aim of providing immediate accommodation to female ex-offenders in need. It's the only all-female shelter catering to ex-offenders in Singapore. 
We provide them with a structured environment. The girls will follow a regime, a schedule, uh, where we open at 7 o'clock and we close at 10 p.m. So our girls will come back at 10 p.m. The shelter offers employment assistance as well, which is essential, especially because of the discrimination ex-offenders face, direct or indirect. HR all come and interview me you know, because I say I'm an ex-offender. So they ask me one question, as a cleaner, you know, <laughs> what do you see yourself in five years' time? <laughs> I'm a good mother. <laughs> I mean, I'm not there to interview as a any high post correct not. The shelter has housed more than 150 women over the years. Next year, they say one of their main sources of funding will run out and it will take another fundraising effort to keep operations going. But their work continues in the hope that more ex-offenders can eventually hit a steady state in recovery, find joy again. What has been the most helpful for you in terms of staying in recovery? What has been... Um, Making a <laughs> and a new beginning. In and out of rehabilitation centers for the past nine years. The road to recovery has been a rocky one for 32-year-old Ridwan. He's still struggling to stay clean. But a strong support system back home is now helping things along. Ridwan, not his real name, is under the National Anti-Drug Agency's home monitoring program. For the next two years, he must report to district office every two weeks for urine tests. He's done well so far. His mother, Sadia Raza, has been the rock in his recovery process. She told me that she's taken charge of making sure he keeps himself occupied and sticks to a routine every day, including praying five times a day, a spiritual commitment that's helping him stay focused and motivated. This time round, Sadia is optimistic, especially when she sees her son getting involved in the community, such as by repairing motorcycles in the village. Now, rehabilitation programs in the northern parts of Malaysia are giving recovering drug addicts more psychological and spiritual help. Member of Parliament Nuru Iza, who visited Ridwan and his family in her Pramatang Bao constituency, says support such as Islamic spiritual intervention plays a key role in mitigating relapses. This has helped increase retention of a rehabilitation program by 30 percent. She's been actively promoting a holistic program called SIDA since 2018 to complement the anti-drug agency's program by collaborating with local mosques and volunteers. Some 60 drug users have participated in a pilot project so far. The module combines medication and counselling as well as daily recital of Islamic verses. Getting recovering addicts to be accepted by the community is a challenge, she said. Nuru hopes that the program will help destigmatize drug addiction, with the public recognizing it as a treatable illness instead of a crime, clogging up prisons and detention centers. We want to save not just the children, the parents, but the communities, because everyone deserves a second chance, especially when they're striving to, to work so hard. But the prolonged isolation due to the extended lockdown saw many drug users under rehabilitation relapsing during the pandemic. Now, with movement restrictions and closure of mosques and places of worship, rendering social and spiritual support for drug users has gotten a lot harder for religious leaders and volunteers. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown a wrench in drug rehabilitation initiatives around the country, setting some drug users back in the recovery process. Mother of five, Nuru Hidayah said her family has felt cut off from support programs since the pandemic struck. She and her husband have struggled with drug addiction for years. They've been getting back on the right track. But with the growing isolation and stress amid the pandemic, she's worried she might slip again. 
kita fry sebenarnya. Kita ikut hati, kita buat macam tu, kita ikut hati. Lepas tu kita nak patah balik. Kadang-kadang kita dah malu. Kan? Kadang-kadang kita tak ada siapa-siapa. Substance abuse is prevalent in these isolated villages in Pramatang Pau. And for some, it's a multi-generational issue. Yuzinani Abdul Halim says the drug problem is rampant among youths here. She herself fell victim as a teenager. Bila Isak dengan suami, masa umur 16, boleh buat kerja, macam-macam, kuat lah. She's been clean for more than two years now and is determined to stay on the right track so she can look after her grandchildren. This after her own daughter got addicted to drugs. Now, according to Malaysian Police Narcotic Crimes Investigation Department, the use of opiates such as heroin and morphine have come down in recent years, while the use of amphetamine type of stimulants have shot up exponentially, accounting for two-thirds of drug addiction in the country. It's going to be a record year as far as drug haul is concerned, despite the lockdown and tightened border control due to the pandemic. The country's anti-narcotic chief, Razaruddin Hassan, says the police have seized over 180 million US dollars worth of illicit drugs in the first eight months of this year. They include more than 6,000 kilograms of amphetamine, known as shabu. In the last five years, more than 83,000 drug users in Malaysia were on amphetamine-type stimulants, while those on opiates numbered less than 40,000. Within 10 years, we can we calculate that more than 2, two million addicts in Malaysia. He's against decriminalizing drug usage because there isn't an effective cure, especially for synthetic drug users. No country can uh, give us example ataupun template that from this medicine you can cure this addict. To find out more, I first visit a state-run methadone maintenance clinic in the northern state of Penang. Methadone is a drug substitute for opiates. Dr. Hema Malini tells me that the rollout of methadone in Malaysia started over two decades ago, when Malaysia was trying to curb a rise in HIV cases, especially among drug users due to sharing of stringers. So what they did, they want to replace heroin with something safer, you know, like methadone, where they drink it, they don't have to inject it. There are now about 100,000 drug users registered under the program at some 1,000 methadone clinics across the country. Methadone cannot be used for patients who are addicted to synthetic drugs like methamphetamine. For these cases, the weapon of choice now tracks on. How it works is it blocks neuron receptors in the brain that react to stimulants, thus stopping drug users from feeling the effects. But naltrexon only works for highly motivated individuals and need to be closely monitored due to potential side effects. Sometimes uh, because of this uh, depression, they go into uh, suicidality as well. Critics believe that using drugs like methadone to manage addiction has its own dangers. A harm reduction is more of a bandage rather than a long-term solution. But when it comes to drug use, there will always be a risk, such as accidental overdose. The community has a huge role to play in helping these addicts. Kita sukar untuk nak mengatasi masalah stigma community setempat. Mungkin mereka anggap oh ni penagi, mereka ni penagi dan mereka akan kekal jadi penagi dan mereka kekal akan melakukan banyak banyak perkara yang mencuri dan sebagainya. Those in recovery, meanwhile, need the support and motivation. And sometimes, like for Yuzinani and Nuru Hidaya, the motivation can come from even the smallest bundle of joy. Anak jadi elok sudah lah. Belajar bagus, jadi anak bagus. Hidupan dia paling elok sudah. For Dennis and Ashley, community outreach and the distribution of harm reduction supplies intended to lower some of the risks attached to drug use is a calling that's deeply personal. They've walked in the shoes of the clients they now serve. 
Ashley was once a sex worker and Dennis has battled a crack cocaine addiction. I can't deal with this no more. I lose some money, mm -hmm. I'm feeling like myself. That's right. That's I don't want my kids to be looking at me like this. Dennis and Ashley work for Project Weber Renew, a non-profit based in Providence, Rhode Island. We have that personal connection, um, non-judgmental um, perspective on, uh, on their situation. So first and foremost, that connection is invaluable and it's almost impossible. It is impossible to duplicate. The organization aims to better protect sex workers and offer assistance in areas ranging from sexual health to drug recovery and harm reduction. Dennis and Ashley are distributing harm reduction supplies, including clean needles and naloxone, a treatment for opioid overdoses, also commonly referred to as Narcan, which is a brand name. They also distribute fentanyl testing strips so people can see whether the powerful narcotic, up to 100 times stronger than morphine, is cut into their drugs. We say you slowly always use with a person, use with a person who has naloxone, all of these little tools so that the person knows that essentially there are ways that they can use safer. Of course, the ultimate goal would be to get the person to not use, but we recognize that that person in that moment might not be ready for that. So we need to give them those sort of middle messages that really can help keep them safe while they're still using. Harm reduction strategies aim to reduce risks associated with drug use. Advocates say these services are needed now more than ever. Here in the state of Rhode Island, there were a record 384 accidental overdose deaths in 2020. According to the Addiction Center, it has the fifth highest drug overdose rate in the nation. Efforts are underway to try and curb that trend. In July, Rhode Island's governor signed a law making it the first U.S. state to approve a pilot program for safe injection sites, places where people can go to use their pre-obtained drugs under medical supervision without legal consequences. Representative John Edwards was the House sponsor of the bill. I had a cousin, I had the daughter of a cousin die of overdoses. My wife had the same thing, she had one of her cousins die, and the daughter of one of her other cousins also died of an overdose. This is a, a crisis that we've got to stop. Now the bill has passed, an effort is underway to educate the public about this harm reduction method. Rhode Island's Harm Reduction Center pilot program is set to start next year. In the meantime, this exhibition has been created to give people a sense of what these spaces will look like and how they work. There are roughly 120 safe injection facilities operating in 10 nations, including Switzerland, Germany and Canada. They sign in, they'll wait, and then they'll be asked, it's their turn. So they come over, they'll grab their supplies, whatever they need, safety, um, clean supplies. They would go over to a table and they would use. Trained staff would be on hand at the overdose prevention sites, or OPS. There would be nurses and staff on site who have um, emergency supplies ready. The first safe injection site was opened in Switzerland in the mid-1980s. But in Rhode Island and across the US, the concept remains highly polarizing. What kind of a society do we want to live in? We set rules, regulations, laws and parameters for our people to conduct themselves, to comport themselves. But yet, we will say, you want to chase the dragon or shoot up? There's the place to do it. We're going to protect you. We're going to have health people there for you. And we're going to pay for it. But Kara Moser believes her daughter may still be alive today if overdose prevention sites were available in 2018. Eliza died on her 26th birthday. She'd been in and out of treatment for years and had been in recovery for about 10 months. By the time we get her into an ambulance and she's off to the hospital, I was already thinking like, why was she using alone? Why don't we have places that she could have had someone supervising? Ava was at home sick the day her sister died. Her brother Jackson was just 14 when he came home to find Eliza unresponsive on their living room sofa. I don't think it should be the responsibility of siblings and family members to have to administer Narcan to save a family member's life. 
because it's not, it shouldn't be their responsibility when there are people who know how to do that, who are trained how to do that, and there can be facilities where people can do that safely. Proponents for such programs in cities including New York, San Francisco and Philadelphia are pushing lawmakers to follow the lead set by Rhode Island. Rhode Island may be the first to pass statewide safe injection site legislation and advocates hope it won't be the last. Some momentum may be building in parts of the country, but opposition to these programs remains fierce. Efforts to open a supervised injection site in Philadelphia were sidetracked at the start of the year, when a federal court ruled it would violate a 1986 law known as the Crack House Statute. That law outlawed spaces being used to manufacture or use illegal substances. Critics say safe injection sites can increase crime in the surrounding area and encourage drug use. Claims advocates reject and argue such facilities provide greater access to treatment services. Analysts say community resistance and the sheer scale of drug addiction in the US could be barriers to the success of such programs. Fortunately, the, the supervised facilities would tend to attract the people with the greatest chance of fatal overdose uh, so that they would have a somewhat disproportionate effect in, in uh, reducing fatal overdoses. But it, it's still not a solution you can scale up to the size of the problem. Drug overdose deaths rose 30% last year compared to the year before. More than 93,000 people in the U.S. died from overdose, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Back in 2006, New York State made it legal for non-medical professionals to administer Narcan. That means anyone in the state can carry it if they've received training on its use. Since then, the state has taken steps to make it more accessible. Last year, bars and restaurants were added to the list of businesses allowed to administer and possess it. As drug overdose deaths soar, some believe more training on how to use this life-saving treatment is required. The more people that understand and know of it, the better off it is, the better off the population is. And it's, it's not just our population, but anyone who's on an opioid regimen. As the US continues to try and scale back the number of drug overdose deaths, stigma is seen by many as a persistent barrier. Those pushing for new ways of combating the crisis believe that stigma is costing lives.